very, very much. You know, go ahead and open your Bible, if you will, to the book of Zechariah. And as you will recall this morning, we were in, we talked out of the book of Zechariah, and uh, it was an amazing thing. All afternoon, I kept saying, something wasn't right. You know, and I, I went back, uh, read it over my mind, and I said, well, you know, where was I? So I, I turned back and I looked at it and I said, well, uh, we're going to look at it again. We're going to look at chapter 4 tonight. And uh, the first first 10 verses, I, I looked at them and they, they just came, came alive. And I thought, well, I hope it was just that way this morning. But when we were in what I would call part 2, but actually, I should have been where I am tonight. But uh, anyway, I'm going to talk about God's Spirit makes the difference. And we find that here in, in Zechariah, the fourth chapter, verse uh, 1 through 10. And here we, we see in the 10 visions, the flying falls. So, Let's read this for just a moment. Then I turned and lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a flying roll. And he said unto me, What seest thou? And I answered, I see a flying roll. The length thereof is twenty cubits, and the breadth thereof ten cubits. Then said he unto me, this is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. For every one that stealeth shall be cut off as one on this side according to it. And every one that sweareth shall be cut off on that side according to it. I will bring it forth, said the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter into the house of the thief, and into the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name. <clears throat> and it shall remain in the midst of his house, and shall consume it with the timber thereof, and the stones thereof. Now we see the, the ten visions. Then the angel that talked with me went forth, and said unto me, Lift up now thine eyes, and see what is this that goeth forth. And I said, What is it? And he said, This is a Nephi that goeth forth. He said, Moreover, this is their remembrance, a resemblance to all the earth. And behold, there was lifted up a talent of man. And this is a woman that sitteth in the midst of the ephod. And he said, this is wickedness. And he cast it into the midst of the ephod, and he cast the weight of lead upon the mouth thereof. Then lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, there came out two women, and the wind was in their wings. For well, they had wings like the wings of a stork, and they lifted up the ephod between the earth and heaven. Then I then said I to the angel that talked with me, Whither do these bear the ephod? Heavenly Father, we come once again to the throne of grace to thank you for this opportunity to open your word, to expand upon it. And Father, we pray tonight as you speak to us and we, we speak and we answer and we go back out in, into this world that we might share this with a lost and dying world. Father, they won't understand it, but we will and we'll go and we'll share it in thy name. Amen and amen. Preacher, I'm lost. Where are you at? Chapter 5. Chapter 5. 
Okay. Chapter five. I'm sorry. I thought you said chapter four. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I did. I, I did say four. I, I read read four. Uh, this, this morning I was in chapter five, and uh, so it, uh, it it gets kind of out of sequence, and uh, I didn't intend it that way, but it, it just worked out that way. And this afternoon I was was looking at scripture and studying a little bit and, and I said, well, you know, what I'm reading right here is uh, goes right with chapter five. And so uh, we, we see this tonight that after Haggai had been preaching for two months about the needs for, for rebuilding the temple, that a young man appeared on the scene and he appeared on the scene as a co-worker. And so a, he was an optimist and he had been called one of the brightest, the clearest, the most hopeful to be found in prophetic literature. And, and I thought about that. that. That said a lot about a person. And the general background of his ministry was obvious. His background was the same as Haggai's. And this small band of returned exiles, what they were doing, they were seeking against great odds to serve the Lord in a land where they, they were hemmed in and they had little or no breathing room. And so these two prophets, here they varied in, in personality. They were just as uh, as different as day and night, you might say. And Zachary was a was an activist, and he was uh, busting with energy and practicality. And and Zechariah, being a priest, he was a student of the, of the Bible. And uh, one likely to see visions and to uh, to dream dreams. And so one scholar here, he contrasts it. That's what he said. He said, Haggai, I will handle the hammer and the nails, but Zechariah will supply the blueprints of the utopia. And so we see here the spiritual inside of the Amish. It'll be wedded, it'll be wedded to the, um, the practical drive of the real. Both men, however, had the same consuming passions. Now, I find that interesting. The temple had to be rebuilt, and the reason it had to be rebuilt was so Jerusalem could become the center of universal religion. Uh, it wasn't always so, and so we, we see here when they're beginning to get ready and reading and interpreting the book of, of this mysterious man of God, it, it's, it's not easy. But a simple outline really should help. And so we see here the book opens with an earnest appeal for the people to return to the Lord. Here in chapter 1, verse 1 down through 6. So this appeal... There is followed by a series of eight versions, uh, one through seven and down to 68, containing words of encouragement, and they were to encourage all of the people. And as they dwell here in the land without a temple, expressed by hardship. It was very, very hard in those days. They had, had no temple. They didn't have much of, of anything. And the third section here, 9 through 15, has been called a historical appendix to the symbolic messages. And so Zechariah here, he, he's urged to crown Joshua as the high priest. And not only is he to crown him as high priest, but he's to declare him the uh, 
the branch who will rule over all the people. A, a, a fine division is our fourth division, I guess I, I should say. Uh, you find that in 7th chapter 1 to 8.23. And it deals with a question about the days of fasting. And these days will be times of celebration, be time when Jerusalem becomes a center of the religion and a source of blessing to all the world. Everything will assume from there. And this final portion of the book, season the ninth chapter over to the fourteenth, concerns a a matter situation. It, we see here where, where the the nations are, are restless, and they threaten every one of them threatened Jerusalem. They're going to attack them in this small community in the city. And the people that are scattered among many nations, they are assured of one thing. They are assured of God's help. They know that they know that they know that God will help them. And he'll help them always in gaining victory over their enemies. And we see that even today. Do not mess with Israel. That's right, Lord. I don't care how many tanks and rocket ships and all you've got, do not mess with Israel. And so the, the book here, it, it closes with a graphic description of, a, of, of the Lord's universal reign with Jerusalem. And uh, because Jerusalem is the center of all hope. And to cover Zechariah's book in such a brief message, that is absolutely impossible. But what we can do is we can discover several key teachings that seem to, to summarize this theme. And before either nation or individuals can be right with God, they have to face their sin and forsake it. That's, right. That's the same for everybody in the world. And Zacharias, we see here, he begins his ministry with a, with a very strong announcement uh, regarding sin. Let's read it. He said, the children were born against following the past of their father. Don't follow a daddy into the, the scene. So this previous generation had turned a, a deaf ear to the, to the works of the uh, prophet. And then they had also failed to change their ways. The post-exile co community that we see here needed to avoid a repetition of, of this tragic mistake. And Zechariah's first message, it was a, a clearing call to repentance. This is what he said. Return to me, declares the Lord Almighty, and I will return to you. That is so today. The result of this previous generation of, of sin was, was their captivity. When the individuals look back at, at the blessings of a previous generation and they see what they had missed because of sin. They should determine to, to follow God in their own lifetime. We should follow God. We, we can't help what happened a hundred years ago or even yesterday. We can't change five minutes ago. But we can change the future. We can follow Jesus Christ. We can follow God. Amen. And the disobedient predecessors of, of Zechariah, it was a generation that once had worshipped in Solomon's temple. And 
how they it had failed. And the song of the Levites rang throughout the arches of the Lord's house. And at one time, the banners of Judah had struck over all across. They had terror in the hearts of their enemies. But sadness, there's those that don't fail. After Zechariah gave a call to repentance, but he probably advised the people to rebuild the temple. Now the Bible doesn't say he does, but sister, what it says is it leads to that. Now, having said that, we, we do not have a record of those words. He must have mentioned in the temple. And I say that because the first part of his um, ministry paralleled Haggai's and preceded the the temple's construction. And that led me to believe that. Every person in every nation must repent in order to please God and serve. No exception. God will always be with his people. He had a chosen Israel. And he chose Israel. And, he chose, and there's no doubt that Israel was God's chosen people. But he, he had a chosen Israel for a redemptive mission. And his whole reason that he chose was to bring the Messiah into the world. No one could ever despise a small thing. Although God's work may have to, to uh, have a feeble beginning, there is no doubt he will bring it to pass. Dr. Clyde for Francisco, some of you may have heard that name. This is what he said. He said, it is not a question of your strength, but of God's strength. And ain't that the truth? I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. But God has the power to break through evil. He's done it time after time after time. And he will do this to bring salvation to his people and he will dwell with them and in them. But, and let me say this, for this to be done, sin must be punished. And God's business must prevail. Always. Only God can break that deadly grip of sin and then remove its contaminating presence. You know, you think sometimes how great I am, but there's something you cannot do. An ideal land is one where sin is finished, it's gone. But, but, we cannot win the victory in our own strength. As smart and sharp as we are, we cannot do that. God must come into the arena for us. And he promised Israel that he would do that. And he said he would do that in Jesus Christ. You see, the victory is not complete until he returns in glory. But the promise is there. I don't have any idea when the Lord's coming. It may be before we leave. It may be a hundred years from now. But coming, he is. Right. And uh, in that part of Zechariah's prophecy, you see, it's so difficult 
to understand. And scholars, they have disagreed as to the full fulfillment of many things that the tradition here says. But one thing is absolutely certain. God will never be defeated. His purpose and history will triumph. And Jesus Christ's redemption has come into this world. Those who have received Christ are on God's side. And with all the evidence, they will emerge victoriously when history is consumed. During the dark days of, of the Civil War, reading the, the history we remember, someone one time asked Abraham Lincoln, he said, Mr. President, have you prayed for God to be on our side? You know the surprising answers that he gave? He said, no. And they looked at him, or the President of the United States had next for God to be on his side against the rebel. He said, I have not prayed that prayer, but I have prayed another one. I have prayed that God will help me to be certain that I'm on his side. Mm. And that is what matters. God is righteous, and righteous will be the mark of wisdom to find out whether God is going and find out where God is going. That's our job. And then go with him. The theme out of our text just runs throughout the entire book of Zechariah. Human effort will not win the victory. Assyria, Babylon, Persia, they were nations that had all been built on, on might and on power. But the first two had already fallen. And the third will fall very soon. In fact, today it's already fallen. Those who followed their action. They would likewise rise, but they would also fall. But God's kingdom will go on forever and ever because it is a spiritual kingdom. We would have been wise to build our lives not on material things that fly away and they fade away, but on spiritual things that will last forever and ever and ever. And on that rock I stand. Amen. Give you prayer benediction. Father God, again, we give you praise and honor for your opportunity. Father, thank you for this time together to worship you. Father, thank you for this message. Be with us now in all things that we do. Lord, be with us as we go out of these doors that we may continue to serve you and be your servants. In Jesus' name, amen.